Yes, thank you. you very much. And um, thanks for uh, for organizing the event and for inviting for inviting me to take part. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but it's a pleasure to be able to um, to to take part. I have a very bad connection, so if the sound doesn't work, please cut off your video because I think we need all the bandwidth for for the audio. But that's just a technical comment. Okay, and what I will do is I work in the um, in the National Institute for Ecology and Climate Change, which is a body created by Mexicans Climate Change Law. We're a sort of technical institute and think tank that is part of the federal government, but is arm's length from other bodies. And so I coordinated much of the technical analysis to create the INDCs. So I can tell you a bit about the content of the INDCs and also a little bit about the process and how we managed to, to agree what we agreed. So if I can move to the, to the first slide after the cover, it's just a quick list of contents. So I'll describe briefly the, the previous climate change efforts and our institutional framework, which helped us um, put together our INDCs. Then I'll describe Mexico's INDC commitments, what we actually said. I'll talk a bit about our, about our process, um, and also a few words on the business as usual baseline, which is a way that we decided to express our ambition. There's a lot of technical debate here, and I'm happy to go into it further on questions. Um, but I wanted to put sort of our position and our thinking. And then very quickly mention some of the, some of the measures, uh, sector by sector, that we think will be required. Well, rather, that we have identified as necessary. Um, and then maybe a little bit on further work and what we have learned. Um, we're very happy that we've managed to put together an INDC and publish it, uh, but it's just the beginning. And that's, that's what we discovered doing this work. Um, so I'll, I'll try to go quickly. The next slide, I hope you can see a timeline. I won't take too much of your time, but what this shows is that in the current, um, so in October of 2012, we passed a climate change law and we see that as a sort of starting point of the current institutional framework. Although a lot of very good work had been done in Mexico technically and politically to make this climate change law possible. Uh, but we had a climate change law in October. A new presidential administration started in December of 2012. So we see that as a bit of a starting point. So in, in December of 2012, we have a climate change fund. In 2013, many things happen, including the creation of the institute where I work the publishing of a national strategy, and we had a, a carbon tax included in our tax reform. Um, and then in April of 2014, we had a sort of uh, a federal government program um, of, of climate action and, and many other things. And then in March 2015, we published our um, INDCs. So this, this helps explain the next slide. The next slide is a kind of diagram it's a bit conceptual. It has a hexagon surrounded by hexagons. I'm not sure what, what this means geometrically. But anyway, this is to show that because of the work we've done based on our climate change law and previous work, we now have a climate change system. So there's an interministerial commission with 14 ministries. Um, and if we go to the left, we have a climate change council, which is 15 distinguished citizens um, from academia, from industry, from civil society, that are a sort of independent voice. The Congress, the municipalities, and the state governments all have a role to play in this national system by bringing um, commitments to the table and by expressing views. And then we have INEC, which is the National Institute for Ecology and Climate Change, where I work. And part of INEC is a sort of evaluation uh, committee or coordination where six independent citizens and the president of the institute where I work evaluate the country's progress on climate change and the country's politics on climate, policies on climate change. So I'm taking a bit of time describing the history and the institutional framework because this allowed us to put together our INDCs in a relatively short time. Um, we had done some a lot of previous work over the past two or three years, and that allowed us to um, to move quickly. So I'll, I'll move on to the next slide now. 
it's a slide five, though we can't see the number. These are our INDC commitments. So I'll try to describe these to you briefly. Uh, this slide is on the non-conditional commitments. These are the things that Mexico is saying it will do regardless of international agreements and regardless of the levels of access to uh, international finance and, um, and technology and capacity building support. So the headline figures are for greenhouse gas uh, emissions, we are committing to reduce our, uh, in the period of 2020 to 2030, we'll reduce our emissions versus a business as usual baseline. You have there the baseline uh, for 2020, 25, and 2030. And our goal for 2030 is to emit 762 million tons of CO2 equivalent versus 973. So I hope you can see 2030 baseline in dark gray and 2030 gold in green. And so that is a, that's a difference of 22%. And that's the commitment of greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Another important commitment is that we will have a peak before 2030. We estimate it to be around 2026. Um, and that means that we'll probably be emitting about, I don't know, 800, 810 a million tons around by 2026 instead of the uh, 890 or 900 that we would otherwise. So that's in terms of greenhouse gas um, emissions. We also have other goals which to us are very important and they're also absolutely non-conditional. Um, Mexico's climate policy gives great importance to short-lived climate pollutants, in particular to black carbon. Um, we know that it is difficult to express the climate impacts of short-lived climate pollutants uh, in terms of a global warming potential to a hundred year time horizon. But at the same time, in a short time frame, we know they're tremendously important for climate change. At the same time, uh, many of these pollutants have strong health impacts and so mitigation brings strong health, public health benefits. So we will reduce our black carbon emissions uh, by 51% versus the baseline. And something else that's very important in Mexico is our adaptation policies. We have clear adaptation pledges in our INDC. Our adaptation work is geographically based, and we see adaptation along three main pillars, um, social, the social pillar, the ecosystem pillar, and the strategic infrastructure pillar. And we have one quantified numerical commitment in each of these three pillars and a lot of other actions uh, which we will define as we go along because um, the, the framework to understand and communicate adaptation is, is less developed than mitigation and I'll go into that in more detail later. And just very quickly, um, as has been said and I'll describe this further later on, we do use a business as usual baseline. It's a dynamic baseline, that is to say it is a forecast and if we receive new information, we will update our forecast. Of course, we then have to think about how we retain transparency, and we're working on that. Um, also, in the land use sector, our baseline does not include the sinks due to the land use that remains unchanged, forest lands which remain forest lands, the grasslands which remain grasslands. Um, and I can talk about that a bit later and, and in questions if you really want to get into detail on that. The idea was to be consistent with a Kyoto Protocol vision on target setting, where LULUCF is not considered for setting targets, but LULUCF actions are quantified as mitigation actions. If we can go to the next slide, please. Another aspect that we consider important of our INDC <clears throat> is that we have a conditional commitment. That is to say, if certain conditions are met, we can do more. But the conditions are ambitious. We need to see a strong global agreement, and it has to include a global carbon price signal, and also access to financing and to technology transfer, and all of these things in a level proportional to the challenge. Climate change will require very deep structural reform, and so a little bit of finance here and there, or um, a little bit of a, a token carbon price in some countries won't be enough. Um, if this is met, we can reach up to 36% emissions reductions versus baseline for greenhouse gases, 
and up to 70% for black carbon. So from 22 to 36, that's 14% more in greenhouse gases. And from 51 to 70, that's 19% more uh, for black carbon. Um, a quick methodological discussion here. For the for the non-conditional, for the 22% that we are committing to, we have detailed bottom-up analyses of all of the things we have to do. To reach the 36%, um, the analysis is a bit less detailed. This comes from a sort of ideal or optimal pathway between where we are today and where we would have to be in 2050 for the two-degree target to be reached. So this is this difference between the 22 and the 36 is an acknowledgement of the gap in ambition that the world needs to, to plug. We just want to make this clear. Um, but to address this, we will need some, some very important agreements and some very big changes. If we can go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about adaptation. And we, we do think this is um, well, actually adaptation in Mexico's climate change law, adaptation is, um, is, is given some priority over mitigation. Uh, both are necessary, and we have targets in both. Um, but adaptation is local, so it, it directly responds to um, our, our government and our society taking care of our own vulnerable people. So as I said earlier, we have adaptation along three pillars, the social, the ecosystem and the strategic infrastructure. And in the social sector, our numerical target is to reduce the number of vulnerable municipalities by 50%. That is to say, we have today a list of 319 most vulnerable municipalities in terms of most vulnerable to climate change. And the commitment is that by 2030, half of those will no longer be on that list because we will have reduced their risk profile. Um, but we also have other dimensions in our social adaptation sector, um, including uh, a, a gender a human rights approach, approach to all territorial planning and risk management, increasing financial resources to risk to disaster prevention versus, um, versus cure, versus attention after the disaster, regulations for land use, integrated watershed management, and um, social participation. In terms of ecosystems, our concrete target is that by 2030, the net deforestation rate will be uh, 0%. This is not only an important ecosystem adaptation measure, but it's, of course, also a very important mitigation measure. Um, and this really illustrates the, the synergies that one can achieve between mitigation and adaptation. But we have other very clear adaptation-based, um, sorry, ecosystem-based adaptation goals, including ecological connectivity, uh, working on coastal ecosystems in particular for carbon confinement, and others. In terms of strategic infrastructure, this is a very broad range. Um, and, and to us, early warning is an important part of the whole risk management approach. Um, and we have some good warning systems in Mexico regarding earthquakes, um, but we, we have to strengthen our our know-how in terms of, of extreme weather events. Uh, but the, the, the quantifiable target here is to guarantee and monitor industrial and urban wastewater treatments for settlements larger than 500,000 inhabitants. So for these populations, their wastewater um, treatment facilities will be, will be protected from, from climate change impact. So I'll move on now into some of the process points. How did we create? The, um, the INDC. So the analytical work was led by, um, it was joint effort between our environment ministry and the institute where I, where I work, together with our foreign ministry. We had um, civil society engagement um, with, a, with our Climate Change Council of Distinguished Citizens in November, and also a workshop in February. And this engagement has continued. Um, with an online survey and other tools. Uh, but the approval process was through our um, Climate Change Commission 
of 14 ministries. So that, this is why the institutional framework helped us be more agile in our consultations and in our approval. Um, the forecasting includes macroeconomic forecasts and sector estimates. And, um, and I'll talk a bit more about our mitigation ambition in detail. In terms of the business as usual, uh, we believe that a business as usual baseline is an appropriate reference for developing countries where emissions are still growing. Um, and we believe that if a baseline is a forecast, you should have the best forecast that you can. So it is reasonable to improve the forecast if information improves, although of course one shouldn't change this every day. We had a number of changes in Mexico, including an update to our inventory that meant that we had to update our baseline from when we published three years ago. But we do fully recognize that it is the onus is on the reporting country to show transparency and to show that ambition is conserved if a baseline is changed. We recognize there is a risk of just changing the baseline so the target becomes easier to meet. And we realize that in the next few months and years, we have to be very clear on what are our um, methodologies so that when future baseline changes happen, everybody is, is happy that we are conserving our level of ambition. I'll now talk about the different sectors, although I'm, I'm probably running out of time, so I'll try to make this quickly, quick. quick. <clears throat> In terms of large single source emitters, our main strategy is to increase what we call clean energy, so that they make up 35% of our clean energy matrix, of our electricity matrix by 2024, and 40% or more towards 2030. We're also substituting heavy fuels and natural gas, um, an important effort in reducing methane leakages, and also black carbon. In terms of transport, our main strategies will be to harmonize uh, fleet efficiency and fleet particle emissions with North American standards. Um, but we are also looking to um, <clears throat> uh, to promote um, different modes of both cargo and transport and passenger transport. In terms of cities, um, we are looking at building efficiency standards and. Uh, very importantly, solar water heaters and distributed power generation. And we also want to work very hard on waste management and all of the methane that that implies. Um, in agriculture, livestock and forestry, as we discussed, we have the zero rates uh, of, of deforestation, net deforestation. And we also want to increase the productivity of some of our forest land, increasing also its biomass. Um, and we're also looking at technification in rural areas, including biodigesters and biofertilizers. We recognize the importance of economy-wide measures. I'm on slide 14 now. Um, we already have a carbon tax in Mexico, although it is, it is um, not very high. The figure is there, and that's important. And we are very much looking into the, the, the possibility of, a, of an emissions trading scheme. Um, we're looking at this very seriously. In fact, we've already created a registry where all emitters above a certain threshold have to register. And um, that's going to come into force very soon. And with that registry in place, it will be relatively easy to, uh, to administer a carbon market. Um, and we, we, we're working closely with the state of California on this, as we have a MOU and they have a carbon market already. So I'll try to finish up quickly now. Um, <clears throat> Our further work is <clears throat> this INDC sort of expresses our ambition, but we still have to work out a lot of detailed measures within the country, within the different sectors. Uh, we know that we need to establish trajectories so that halfway through the cycle we can say if we're on track or not. That's very important. With a 15-year target, a person today can always say, oh, it's very far in the future. And the person in the future can say, well, I can't do this because they didn't do the right thing for 10 years or 15 years. So we will need to establish uh, trajectories or pathways. And we also need a, a much more robust MRV system to actually monitor uh, the mitigation that is being achieved and be able to give confidence internationally that we are delivering all of this. So very quickly, what we learned is that <clears throat> it's quite difficult if you do a lot of technical work to communicate your methodological assumptions. The INDC itself was a short document, about five pages long, and we couldn't reflect almost any of the analysis that we had done. Um, 
Estimating an incremental mitigation is relatively easy. Estimating it, not doing it. But what is difficult is to imagine an economy where you're actually consistent with a two-degree target. That requires very deep structural change. And a bottom-up analysis uh, wasn't enough in our case. And that's why we had to go further with our conditional commitment uh, that required a much deeper change. And so what you have to do <clears throat> is reach the limit of what you think your country can achieve and then keep analyzing options, asking yourself, what would happen? have to be true for this to happen. Uh, just one quick comment. When we published our INDC with our conditional commitments, talking about an international carbon price, um, one analyst described it as a poison pill. That is to say that if that we somehow saying the commitment wasn't very serious because you know the conditions will never be met. We don't see it that way. We see it more as the emperor's new clothes. If we know that big international commitments are required for us to change, to this level, then let's start saying it and let's get the ambition of the negotiations up to that level. And also communicating ambition is very difficult. Uh, the press will probably get it wrong and you shouldn't really worry about that uh, because it's just too complicated to communicate. So those were my thoughts. Um, I hope I've stayed within the time, but I'm very open for, for questions and thank you for, for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Boyera. Uh, that was really quite helpful, uh, and I will open the floor, and I think I see hands up already. <laughs> uh, so uh, first, uh, my uh, friend Sidati from uh, Mauritania. And uh, uh, what we'll do, Dr. Boyera, is that we'll take uh, a few couple of questions, put to them together, and then uh, give you the floor uh, to respond. Thank you. Yes, uh, Sidati, please. Bonjour, Monsieur l'interlocuteur. Je vous remercie sur l'effort et la clarté de la présentation du document. Euh, mais je m'excuse à votre part parce que je ne parle que français. Et je sais que vous êtes lisophone. Euh, ma question s'articule sur la différence entre la ligne de base choisie et les stratégies nationaux en matière de développement. En plus, comment vous avez pu tirer un engagement de surplus si la ligne de base choisie ne s'articule pas sur les stratégies déjà programmées ou prévisibles Donc, comment vous avez pu tirer un engagement comme surplus et sur quelle base euh, Est-ce que cette ligne de base tient compte déjà de ces stratégies ou se base sur le développement socio-économique prévisible Quel est le fondement théorique derrière cette ligne de base qui me permet d'avoir une autre vision qui peut me donner un engagement non conditionnel Je vous remercie. C'est un peu long. Malheureusement. Uh, yes, uh, Baba Kair from Senegal. Okay. Thank you. So I will thank you again for the for the presentation. I have a couple questions. I, the, the first one is that why is there a distinction between mitigation and uh, adaptation INDC? On your mitigation, you have uh, the non conditional and the conditional. While on adaptation, you don't have the, uh, the uh, you know, you don't have that distinction. Uh, my second question is related to your forecast and your dynamic baseline. Uh, I would like to know what type of tool do you use for that? I mean, what's the management system that, that you put in place f for that? Uh, I, will, I will stop for that for now. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, follow French. Uh, if you don't, then I can uh, request uh, my colleague Ruth here to translate it into English. Well, I, I followed French better 20 years ago than I do today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, if, but if I understood correctly, it had to do with how we have modeled the baseline uh, with a view to uh, economic and social development. 
Um, and I can talk about that, but, but that's yeah, yeah, what I, I got. see that in noting is a specific said. element, I would appreciate translation. See, uh, Siddharthi noting his head that you got the question. Yeah, right. Okay, so shall I shall I answer? Super, great. Well, thank you for the <clears throat> for the questions, and we have spent a lot of time um, working on the baseline, and we know it. We knew we would get questions here, so first I'll talk about. The, the, the quick answer about the difference between mitigation and adaptation. So in mitigation, we have a lot more quantified understanding of what we can do. So we reached the non-conditional, and then we said, okay, this is as much as we can do, and we realized how much more has to be done and said, that's conditional. With adaptation, we still don't know enough. So what we wrote down as quantified and we're, things that we're certain about in terms of quantifiable impacts, that's all non-conditional. And we expect that the non-conditional will grow as we become better at planning and understanding how we are going to go about adaptation. Maybe someday we will reach a non-conditional adaptation, sorry, a conditional adaptation. But right now what we have planned in adaptation is much less than what we know we can do. We just aren't able to fully quantify it yet um, and express it. It's, it's a very complex, um, multi-dimensional space um, adaptation, which is why, why we're communicating it differently. And in terms of the baseline, I'll try to discuss a bit how we've, how we've done this. Essentially, the, the baseline in itself assumes business as usual growth, so we use some generic macroeconomic growth forecasts, like a gross domestic product forecast and a population forecast. And we also think sector by sector how things might grow. Sometimes we consult sector specialists. Sometimes uh, we use existing models. For example, for our electricity grid, we have a Ministry of Energy that works with our national power company to do some rather detailed planning. And we basically took their plans. We made modifications, but we started from their plans. So we take sector specifics. For the industry sector, we talked to our cement uh, chamber of commerce and our steel chamber of commerce and other important industries that are high emitters and understood their forecasts. Then we put them all together, and we had to use some of our own expert judgment and we have uh, some technical people in the Institute who helped us do that and the question is would this happen naturally without a climate change law and the truth is that there are some improvements and some uh, energy efficiency improvements that happen even without climate change and there are some environmental rules that ask for improvement even without climate change law um, and in terms of the gross domestic product, we don't actually have a, an official forecast that goes uh, 15 or 20 years into the future. So we, we ran a special study using the Cook method, which is a kind of statistical weighting of expert opinions. Now, how does this relate to, which is the, so that's kind of how we built it. How does this relate to economic and social development? And that's, that's really very important. Um, and I'd like to mention one other thing in our baseline, which is that we have just had an energy reform, which will increase investment in our oil and gas production. So our hydrocarbon production is going to increase. So we had to factor in that in one sector, at least, we would emit more. Um, so the baseline is built around a credible development scenario. It's a scenario where the country's economy will grow. The challenge is to introduce mitigation measures that do not slow down this growth. Um, and what we did there is that we looked at the different measures and we understood their investment profiles and their benefits and their co-benefits. Um, and in particular, for example, in our power sector, in our electrical power sector, we realized that with a strong investment in renewables using an auction process, 
to get a good price. We could socialize the cost of additional investment. And in the long term, we would pay less fuel bills. So we do have economic modeling for some, not for all of the measures, for some of the measures. Um, and that's because we had done some previous work. Uh, when we started our INDC uh, about six, seven months ago, we already had different analyses. We had a marginal abatement cost curve. We used a general equilibrium model uh, of the Mexican economy. We also used some poles modeling, which is energy sector specific modeling. So we already had some analytical inputs, which we included. And that's why we reached this 22%. Additional measures would have been too costly unless there is an international carbon price and access to finance. If we have access to finance and there is a strong international carbon price, then we can ask our factories to invest even more in the cleaner technologies. But if there aren't these conditions, they will lose competitiveness. And so it was exactly that economic growth and that cost consideration that made us say, OK, this is as far as we can go. Here's the 22%. It's still very ambitious. It's still going to be very difficult to achieve. There was still a lot of resistance from within the country. Um, but that was the balance. And all the rest, we said that, uh, that those measures would be conditional. I, I hope that helps explain some of our thinking. Uh, follow up. Yes. Malgré nous, ce n'est pas applicable en Afrique. C'est un peu difficile à appliquer ce genre en Afrique où tout est, tout est politiquement imprévisionnel. C'est vrai que pour un pays émergent comme le Mexique, ça peut marcher. C'est même facile à le faire marcher malgré l'effort. So my, my consideration there would be, and again, I'm sorry if I didn't understand all of the question, but my recommendation, if at all possible, uh, for, for Africa would be to try to avoid lock-in um, in, in dirty assets, is try to leapfrog to cleaner technologies, um, especially in, in electricity generation. We are trying to do that in some of our communities that don't have access to electrical power today. Um, and that's all about finding the, the programs and the funds financing because in the longer term you are freeing people from from a fuel bill and one of our greatest challenges in Mexico is to avoid lock-in to accelerate the cleaner investments because if we don't make the clean investments in the next five years we won't meet our target because an asset that you build now will still be polluting in 20 or in 30 years and so the INDC won't be met so even in Mexico Avoiding lock-in and making sure investment happens in the clean technologies is the biggest challenge. Any further questions from the floor? Uh, we have uh, our uh, participant from uh, uh, Congo. Please go ahead. Merci pour le partage de l'expérience. Je voudrais simplement savoir comment vous avez réussi l'implication des acteurs non étatiques, c'est-à-dire le secteur privé et la société civile dans l'élaboration des vos indices, sachant que, comme vous l'avez mentionné, on est dans un domaine très technique où parfois la communication est difficile. Merci. Yes, of course. Um, I think in every country, the communication with the private sector is a negotiation. We work with the technical people in the private sector to understand what they can do. And we were lucky that we already had some NAMAs and some uh, pre-NAMA analysis. And we also can compare our industry with international best practice and show the opportunity. So the numbers were not the problem. The problem was the 
agreement. So we would say, you can do this, and they would say, ah, I can do it, but that is conditional. So our private sector was less ambitious, and they wanted to say that things that, that we know they can do are conditional. So you have the technical discussion, and you reach a point, and then you make a, a political decision. We have made a commitment for the country, not for one company, not for one region, for the whole country. And now we have to work together to see how we can reach it. Um, the private sector will always protest. Um, at the same time, if the rules are clear and everybody knows that everybody has to do it. Uh, it looks like we have lost the connection to Mexico. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if he un managed to answer that completely, but what we can do is we can uh, uh, try and get his response uh, later on.